Hello, everyone, and welcome to the ESG CV Notice, Office Hours for Urban Counties, Metro Cities, and Territories. My name is Tommy Joe Bednar. I work at Apt Associates, and I'm going to cover just a few logistical and housekeeping notes before we get into the meat of our presentations today. First and foremost, we are recording today's presentation, today's webinar, and that recording along with the slides and a copy of all materials will be available on the HUD Exchange in about two to three business days. Um, so I know many of you will want the slides and the materials. Please look for those on the HUD Exchange, but give us a couple of business days to get this prepared and posted. Um, the link for that is found on your screen as well as for other webinars. And we also hope that you can hear us today. Um, to have the best audio possible, um, we suggest calling in to WebEx. While you might be hearing us now via computer audio, we found that phone audio is the most reliable, it doesn't rely on bandwidth, and we want to make sure that you're able to hear us all today. So you can call in using the phone number on your screen there, or using the phone number that is just put in the chat now. Speaking of chat. We want to make sure that this is an opportunity for you all to ask questions, share experiences, and give comments related to today's material. So we encourage you all to use the chat function. To use that chat function, as shown in the screenshot on your screen now, you'll click on the chat button in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen that says chat and has a nice little bubble in the red box on your screen now. That'll bring up the chat window on the right side of your screen. Please just make sure that you're sending your messages to everyone in the to field. That'll make sure that all of our panelists, along with the other attendees, have the ability to see your questions, comments, and the experiences that you're sharing with everyone today. With that, I'm going to go ahead and hand things over to Marlisa Grogan from the HUD SNAPS office to get us started in earnest. Hi, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us today. I'm Marlisa Grogan from HUD's Office of Special Needs Assistance Programs. I'm also joined by Mamdi Wampler, a program manager from the Philadelphia Field Office, Nora Lally from Homebase, as well as Taylor Keeley from, the, from HUD's Chicago Field Office. Next slide, please. So the purpose of today's webinar is to really build off of the September 3rd, 2020 webinar, which provided a broader overview on the information contained in the ESG CV notice. This webinar is intended for ESG recipients that receive direct funding from HUD that are metro cities, urban counties, and territories. And we are just going to build on some of the basic principles of the ESG CV notice and provide some more examples, get into a little bit more detail that are particularly re relevant for non-state recipients. So if you haven't already seen the, the recording and the chat questions or any other related materials from the ESG CV notice webinar that was presented on September 3rd, please check it out and um, it provides a good basis of understanding. And you will, um, as Tommy Joe mentioned, have all of the materials from this, including the slides, and you'll be able to um, access all of the hyperlinks that we provide here for easy, easy access to all of the materials that we go over today. Next slide, please. <clears throat> So in addition to providing more detailed guidance on the waivers and alternative requirements in the notice, we're going to highlight key grant management requirements, provide a lot of time for Q&A, and then also include material that's more recent, including some additional guidance that's been developed in the interim based on questions that we've been getting a lot, some great questions from you all. So that will also be sprinkled throughout the presentation. Next slide, please. Okay, so we are gonna start with applicability of the waivers and the alternative requirements. So there, there are really four categories of ESG funding. The two on the top relate to ESG CV funds, and then the two on the bottom of the pie chart relate to annual ESG funds. So first, starting with um, the ESG CV funds, the two categories are really based on the timing that the field office, your field office, completed review of your action plan or substantial amendment for ESG CV funds. If the field office completed that review, 
prior to September 1st, 2020, which is the date that we released the ESG CV notice, then all ESG CV notice waivers, flexibilities apply, and the limitations do not apply. <clears throat> now, all references to limitations are explained in that blue box on your screen. When we talk about limitations, we're talking about the January 31st, 2022 deadline for emergency shelter activities and the 12-month cap for medium-term rental assistance. It also includes the requirement, the CARES Act requirement, that um, providers, including recipients and subrecipients, can't require any program participants experiencing homelessness to receive treatment or perform prerequisite activities as a condition for receiving assistance. So you can't require testing, you can't require participation in supportive services. Um, you that cannot be a prerequisite or a condition for receiving ESG assistance funded by ESGCV. So um, going to the second category of ESGCV funds, if you have had your action plan or substantial amendment review completed by the field office on September 1st, 2020 or later, then that's the point at which the limitations apply to that funding. Um, all ESG notice waiver, waivers and flexibilities also apply, but this is the case, the one case where the limitations um, also apply. In no case for annual ESG funds will the limitation apply. So if you're using your annual ESG to prevent, prepare for, and respond to coronavirus, um, the, limit, the limitations would never apply, um, but you also get the uh, added flexibility of the notice waivers and um, alternative requirements. And then if you're not using annual ESG to prevent, prepare for, or respond to coronavirus, then you're just following um, Part 576. And Part 576 is really the backdrop for all ESG and ESG CV funding. Um, it's just the ESG CV notice that makes adjustments to Part 576 regs with the alternative requirements and waiver of those requirements in some cases. Next slide, please. So we're going to start with some examples. If you tuned into the state webinar, these, the state webinar office hours for the ESG CV notice, these may sound from, sound familiar, um, but, and there's really not a whole lot of difference between um, states, states and um, requirements for local government and territories when it comes to the applicability of the CV notice. Um, in this particular example. City number two, or I'm sorry, city number one had their, um, both of their round one and round two ESG CV allocations uploaded in IDIS as of September 1st, 2020. This is very straightforward. You know that um, because the, your um, grants are actually in IDIS already, you've already completed your action plan or substantial amendment submission, you've gone to grant agreement, and so this is a case in where where your both your round one and round two funds um, are not applicable to the limitations. Only the notice waivers and flexibilities apply. Next slide, please. So in this case, City 2 had their first allocation of ESG CV loaded in IDIS as of September 1st. But you know that your second, uh, that the second substantial amendment was submitted in IDIS on September 3rd. So there's no way that the field office could have completed the review of their um, second round funding prior to September 1st. So the first allocation um, limitations do not apply. The waivers and flexibilities do apply for allocation number two. All ESG CV notice waivers, flexibilities, and limitations apply. Example three, <clears throat> this city has not yet submitted their substantial amendment for either the first or second allocations. And so in this case, all of the ESG CV notice waivers, flexibilities, and limitations will apply to all of their ESG CV funding. Next slide, please. 
So we're going to go through some different markers for um, you to be able to tell when the limitations apply. Um, one way is to look at the grant agreement and amendment status. So if your grant agreement is signed for round one prior to 9-1, then you know for sure that your round one funds are not subject to the ESG CV uh, notice limitations. And then if your grant agreement amendment is signed for round two prior to September 1st, then you know for sure that your round two funds are not subject to the ESG CV uh, limitations. Next slide. Another way to tell is um, the status of your grant funds in IDIS. So as we included in the first example, when an allocation, round one or round two, is already in IDIS, so you go into IDIS, you can see your grant funds, then you know for sure that um, those funds are not subject to the ESG CV notice limitations. And um, the, the, more gr the, air, the situation where there's a little bit more gray area is when you submitted a substantial amendment or annual action plan prior to 9-1, but it was pretty close to the date, you haven't been um, in contact with the field office to know for sure about whether the field office completed its review, maybe you're not seeing the grant in IDIS yet, um, you may not have even signed a grant agreement yet, um, that's the time to reach out to your HUD field office representative, and your field office will check the date on their um, action plan or substantial amendment checklist, their internal checklist, and if that is dated earlier than 9-1, then they, will, they can let you know that the limitations do not apply for, for the funds that are um, covered by that substantial amendment or annual action plan. Next slide, please. Okay, so in general, just to recap, when funds from an annual grant are used to prevent, prepare for, or respond to coronavirus, this is annual ESG funds, the limitations never apply. All of the waivers apply, and all our alternative requirements apply. I think there's one case in this ESG CV notice where it says specifically that um, the waiver for um, citizen participation and public comment period do not, the waiver does not apply to annual ESG funds. Um, I think that is the one situation where we call out specifically that, the, um, that a waiver for ESG CV funds is not applicable to annual ESG, um, but otherwise um, in section four, that's really your guide for annual ESG funds. Um, it, we make it clear that all of the waivers and additional eligible activities and flexibilities are all applicable to annual ESG funds as long as you follow all the criteria in section four of the notice. And those, in a, in, a, in a nutshell, are clearly tracking and documenting what portion of funds are used for COVID response, and then making sure um, that you're checking, well, actually, the other thing is um, documentation in, your, in IDIS, which we'll go over in just a little bit. And then another important consideration is that if you're reprogramming prior year funds for COVID response, making sure that you're aware of the impacts of that reprogram or reallocating on expenditure limits, which are still applicable to annual ESG CV funds not used for COVID response. And we are gonna go into some examples of how to check on that right now. Next slide, please. So since you're dealing with um, annual ESG on potentially two pots of funding, um, annual ESG that's used for COVID response versus annual ESG not used for COVID response. You've got one set of funds, um, the, the non-COVID response, that is still applicable to matching requirements and the shelter street outreach cap and the admin cap, um, while you've got the annual ESG for COVID response that is not that doesn't have the match requirements or the expenditure caps for shelter, street outreach, and admin. So this first example, in this first example, we have an ESG award amount of $2 million. And there's $1 million um, 
that you would like to spend for COVID response, and then you've got a million dollars for non-COVID response. And maybe this is just by virtue of the fact that you've already spent a million and um, that was prior to COVID or your community's COVID response starting. So in this scenario, you would have a match requirement that's applicable to $1 million of your total grant. Um, and then you would also have a street outreach shelter expenditure cap of $600,000, 60% of, of the 1 million. And then you would have an admin cap that's applicable to the $1 million for non-COVID response, which comes to $75,000. You do not have a match requirement for the um, COVID response pot, um, neither do you have an expenditure cap. And then the admin cap is not 7.5, but it's 10% um, for annual funds used for COVID response. So you would have a $100,000 admin cap. Next slide, please. So this situation is a little bit more complicated. Um, this is a scenario involving fiscal year 2019 annual ESG that's being re reprogrammed for COVID response. <clears throat> so uh, the $2 million annu um, annual ESG award amount includes an initial emergency shelter street outreach cap of 1.2 million, um, namely 60% of the 2 million and then an initial admin cap of 150,000. So that just by virtue of um, calculating 60% of $2 million for the street outreach emergency shelter cap, and then 7.5% of $2 million for the initial admin cap. <clears throat> so let's say that you've begun expending your 2019 funds and um, what you first want to do is identify the total amount that you've currently expended, including your emergency shelter street outreach and your admin expenditures, to see where you're sort of, where you're coming out, um, like how close you've come to the cap already, and then seeing how much wiggle room you have to reprogram your annual ESG funds for COVID response. So in this scenario, you've expended um, $1 million total already of your grant prior to January 21st, 2020. And of that $1 million that's already been expended, let's say that you've spent $800,000 on emergency shelter and street outreach and $150,000 for admin. So in this case, you, um, you've already gone past if you were to take um, all of the remaining funds, $1 million, and then, and then reprogram that for COVID response, you would run into a little bit of a problem with your, um, with your emergency shelter street outreach cap. You, um, $800,000 of $1 million is, is past the 60%, is past um, the 60% cap. So, um, so that tells you, okay, well, if I move all of the, my re remaining funds to COVID response, then um, I've exceeded the cap for my annual ESG. So instead of, um, instead of moving the, the one million that you'd like to, you have to account for that additional wiggle, uh, amount of wiggle room that you need for your emergency shelter street outreach cap and your, your new annual ESG for non-COVID response needs to be 1,280,000 for you to stay under that 60% cap. So you've got about a $280,000 um, gap that you need to fill. And so what ends up coming, coming out, if you were to recalculate your expenditure caps, you've got um, $280,000 that you need to reserve for annual ESG for non-COVID response and um, then you keep the cap of emergency shelter street outreach at 800,000 and you'd keep your admin cap for um, annual ESG for non-COVID response at 150,000 and that leaves you $720,000 that's available for um, COVID response and 72,000 remaining for admin. <clears throat> 
And I know that's a lot of numbers, and I know that that's, these are actually um, enough to, keep, to make your head spin. We've got some TA products that, um, that we are putting together to try to help you better track this difference between annual ESG for COVID response and annual ESG for non-COVID response to try to take the um, take the math work out of uh, out of the process for you as much as possible and relieve that administrative burden. So those we're hoping to be able to provide for you soon. And then if you run into issues or you're not sure that you're doing it properly, you have any concerns please um, submit an AAQ or you could also talk to your field office and, um, and just ask for help if you're unsure about it. Next slide, please. I know another topic that is on a lot of people's minds is documenting, preventing, preparing for, and responding to coronavirus. So um, one thing that's really important to remember is the scope of this documentation. The connection to coronavirus response is at the activity level, not at the household level. So you do not need to, on an individual program participant or household level, um, try to determine that particular program participants, how they've been impacted by coronavirus. So you, you don't need to be checking for a positive coronavirus um, test result or anything like that. You just need to be explaining in your IDIS activity description how your street outreach, homelessness prevention, rapid rehousing, or emergency shelter activity is, um, is factoring into your community's coronavirus response. So it's really at that level. It's not even, we're not even asking for documentation um, at the, at the sub-component level. So you don't even need to parse out, um, you know, rental assistance versus, uh, you know, supportive service costs. We just want to know in general at the component level, how are you working to prevent, prepare for, and respond to coronavirus? You don't need to accomplish all three categories, just one. So you don't need to be doing, you, need, you don't need to be preventing, preparing for, and responding to all within the same category. Um, you, it can just be one. And we provide more detail and uh, definition for each so that you know how HUD is defining prevention, preparation, and response to coronavirus. And it's important to consider both public health needs as well as the, ac the economic impact caused by coronavirus. So you'll see in the notice that we define responding to coronavirus as um, dealing with the impact, the economic impact that's caused by coronavirus. So, um, so that is, is likely going to be a factor for the long term. So, um, so that is another way to substantiate um, the, how an activity is involved in, in responding to coronavirus. Next slide, please. So here is an example of documentation in the IDIS activity description um, showing how funds are being used to prevent, prepare for, and respond to coronavirus. So in this case, fiscal year 2019 emergency shelter funds are being used both for non-COVID response and for COVID response. So you'll see that there are two headers there in the screenshot. You've got ES, annual, annual ESG for non-COVID response. Um, so in this case, $50,000 from the 2019 emergency shelter activity is budgeted for shelter operations. And then getting more specific for the second subheader, annual ESG for COVID response, it's clearly identifying that um, this activity description, this paragraph is related to COVID and um, a dollar, specific dollar amount is included, $24,000 from the 2019 emergency shelter activity is being reprogrammed for coronavirus response. And you've got the prevention, preparing for, and responding to coronavirus. Um, and you're substantiating that connection because the enhancing shelter sanitation activity is being done per local public health infection control guidelines. And then um, 
documenting that you're using the funds for personal protective equipment and for hygiene supplies. So that's sort of the level of detail that we're talking about when we're um, in the activity description. And then in addition to that documentation, maintain um, your files demonstrating when your state or local government began preparing for coronavirus. So in the notice we say your coronavirus response, you can't be um, paying for costs incurred prior to January 21st, 2020, but um, it's really, we're really hinging the date for um, eligible pre-award costs on when your community began responding to coronavirus. So you would need to maintain um, meeting, like meeting notes, uh, notes for phone calls on uh, coronavirus preparation measures, whatever kind of documentation that shows that your community um, started responding on X date. And on that X date, you can begin incurring costs and um, reimbursing for costs as of that date but no earlier than January 21st, 2020. Next slide, please. This slide goes into a little bit more detail about what I just went over, the earliest date for pre-award costs, January 21st, 2020, um, how you need to maintain adequate documentation. And then in this example, County X began their coronavirus response when their first case within the state was confirmed on January 20th, 2020. So even though the earliest date is January 21st, because County X only has documentation dating back to February 20th, <clears throat> that is the date that they would use to reimburse eligible costs. Next slide, please. Here are important dates that we pulled from the notice. The, um, the date of cost eligibility, January 21st, what we just went over. Obligation for non-states is normally 180 days to obligate from the date of HUD signature on the grant agreement. Um, but if additional time is needed for the specific reason of identifying entities with capacity and expertise to mitigate impacts of coronavirus, then you have up to a total of 240 days to obligate additional ESG CV funds to your subrecipients. And the documentation requirement here is that program records have to describe the changes that you are putting in place to identify and select new subs and why the extension is necessary. We're going to get into a little bit more detail on that in about a, in, a, in a minute. But the other um, really important date is the, um, includes expenditure deadlines and the recapture the recapture dates. So all uh, all ESGCV funds have to be expended by September 30th, 2022. <clears throat> but then there are two preliminary dates. Um, recipients need to expend at least 20% of your total award by September 30th, 2021. And any funds under that 20% mark um, may be recaptured if not expended by that date. And then recipients should expend at least 80% of their total award by March 31st, 2022. Or HUD could recapture up to 80%. Next slide, please. This is um, a graphic that's been included in the new guidance that we've put out. It's the ESG notice summary document on the HUD exchange. And it gives, um, gives you a brief snapshot for um, the different types of recipients and the, um, basically the options for carrying out grant activities. All states, urban counties, metro cities, and territories have the flexibility to administer funds directly when they're used for COVID response. Um, and they all, all of you have the ability to subaward to nonprofits. States, urban counties, and metro cities also have the flexibility to subaward to public housing agencies and local redevelopment authorities. <clears throat> 
And um, states also have the additional flexibility to subaward to urban counties and metro cities. And then as normal, urban counties can also subaward to their metro city member governments. Next slide, please. So um, as I mentioned before, there is additional flexibility for ob um, the timeframes for obligating. And the, um, the reason to do this is to promote equity uh, in expanding the subrecipient pool. So um, when recipients are working to identify and select subs who are representing their communities better, and um, also targeting those communities that have experienced the most impact by coronavirus, that, those are the situations where um, the additional time frame for obligation applies. And if you're using that flexibility, you need to document um, the changes that you're implementing to be able to identify and select those new subs, as well as the outcomes of the process. Um, for example, we were able to identify um, three new subrecipients, or we subawarded funds to um, A, B, and C entity because we expanded our pool uh, and tried to better represent um, the populations impacted by coronavirus. We have a really good resource um, that's linked to um, on this slide, it's increasing equity in the homeless response system through procurement, which is, um, which is really helpful when you're trying to reevaluate your process. Next slide, please. So some strategies to promote equity are um, using data to allocate resources and being able to focus on those areas that have higher percentages of black, indigenous, and people of color who have, um, you know, substantiated by uh, data, a greater risk of contracting and dying from COVID-19. Then um, another approach is doing assertive outreach to community organizations led by black, indigenous, and people of color to encourage their response and encourage their response to an RFP. So making sure that um, your, your RFP is reaching those organizations and that you are, um, you're doing outreach to be able to get responses. And then critically examining and addressing local policies that could actually be standing in the way of expanding your pool. So are you screening those eligible subrecipients out and could um, your processes, your policies be part of the problem from being able to um, include them as subs. Next slide, please. Another strategy is to set specific equity-related procurement goals to be able to increase services in underserved communities, fund subs with diverse senior leadership that are more representative of the community being served, and it can be an actual and explicit um, question in your RFP that's scored. Partnering, partnering with local community foundations, universities, and other philanthropy to support smaller organizations to build in that support network for them. And then it's incentivizing subgrants to organizations with demonstrated success in serving black, indigenous, and people of color. And that this can also be included as an explicit question and um, rating factor for an RFP. Next slide, please. Shifting over to admin, um, we know that this is a lot of money and in, um, in properly and adequately administering these funds, considering um, your admin and how much you're putting towards admin is a really, really important consideration. So there's uh, the increase to 10%, but taking a, a moment to really look at this and um, ensuring that your program has sufficient admin capacity is really important to making sure that you have enough to, um, to fully staff your program and to ramp, ramp, ramp up. Um, the staffing increases are going to be able to help ensure effectiveness in grant management, 
especially when it comes to circumstances where you're trying to expand your pool of subs. So with expanding your pool of subrecipients, um, you're also likely to include those who, who have not um, administered an ESG program before. So, um, so that's going to require more administrative capacity at the recipient level. And then also uh, just considering overhead costs to be able to support additional admin. Um, to uh, support additional staff. So um, it's important for you to know that these overhead costs, laptops, cell phones, office space, or other um, adjustments for remote work, those are all um, eligible for staff who are carrying out the ESG program activities um, as well as admin activities. So you can charge those where you're actually paying for ramping up your direct um, ESG program activities, street outreach, emergency shelter, rapid rehousing, and prevention. Um, you don't need to charge those overhead costs to admin. Those can go directly to the program component. Next slide, please. So here are all of the additional eligible activities. Um, temporary emergency shelter, landlord incentives, volunteer incentives, hand washing stations and portable bathrooms, training and hazard pay. So we are going to focus on the top three here. And um, as we mentioned on this slide, if you'd like to um, additional information, uh, we cover this in the, the, the September 3rd training on the ESG CV notice. Next slide, please. So temporary emergency shelter. Um, I know that this is a struggle for a lot of folks to be able to determine what's emergency shelter, what's temporary emergency shelter. The guidance in the notice is very broad. So um, we've gotten a lot of questions about different examples or potential examples of temporary emergency shelter. And I am hoping that um, that we can provide a little bit more detail here. But actually, before we do, um, why don't we just take a second and we'll start, we'll start going through some questions before we, we shift over to this next segment. That's great, Marlisa. Thank you so much for all the information. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Wonderful. So hi, everybody. This is Mandy Wampler. And I am going to work with Marlisa to get some of your great, great questions addressed um, here in, in real time. So Marlisa, we did have a number of questions come in uh, relative to the applicability of the notice, which we know is a little bit confusing, um, and the limitations that may apply depending on whether the substantial amendment or the plan was reviewed by HUD before or after that September 1st, 2020 deadline. Um, so I do know this was back on slide seven, whereby um, you had that great little graphic and some notes on the limitations. So can you just reiterate for folks, um, I guess the questions really have to do with how someone would know if their substantial amendment has been reviewed by HUD. Um, and so I'm actually happy to take this one um, since I, I do work out in the field um, and just Go for to it. I just want to know that if you have any questions about whether your substantial amendment or your plan has been reviewed by HUD, please reach out to your local field office to determine the actual status. Um, you might see that your substantial amendment or your plan has been reviewed and reflected as reviewed in IDIS, but the status in IDIS, it might not always reflect an accurate current status. So, so work with your field to determine whether or not your, your amendment was reviewed before the September 1st, 2020 deadline. Um, and then just as a follow-up to this, if you received your grant agreement and your funds were obligated in IDIS before September 1st, then that is a very solid indication that your amendment was reviewed by HUD because HUD will not be issuing any grant agreements until after we have completed that review. Um, but one question for you, Marlisa, about the limitations and the applicability of the limitations um, is there is a deadline for 
um, emergency shelter activities. Does that deadline of January 31st, 2022 apply to both emergency shelter activities and temporary shelter activities? Yes. <clears throat> so if you are in a situation where uh, you submitted a substantial amendment or an annual action plan for ESG CV funds, and um, those fund the amendment was reviewed by your field office um, on or after September 1st, 2020, then the emergency shelter deadline does apply, and it applies to both emergency shelter activities as well as temporary emergency shelter activities. Thank you. And this is a question about the spending deadlines in the notice. Um, so both the obligation deadline and then I think, you know, we could also discuss the expenditure deadline. Uh, what's the start date for that, for those deadlines? So the, um, the obligation deadline, um, that hinges off, off of the, the date of HUD's signature on the grant agreement. So um, it's going to be the grant agreement in both cases for round one and round two funding. So even if you did, um, let's say your field office signed the grant agreement on um, August 1st, um, and then you did your grant agreement amendment for round two funds on August 30th, your obligation deadlines are still going to hinge off of that August 1st date for both round one and round two funding. And then your expenditure deadline um, is a firm date regardless of when the grant agreement was signed by HUD. It's going to be September 30th, 2022 in all cases for all ESG recipients. Thank you. All right, we had a couple of questions regarding the discussion around prepare for, prevent, and respond to COVID. Um, and I think some folks are, are wanting to know if you are, if they should be documenting the prepare for, prevent, or respond to COVID at the activity level or at the household level. So can you just reiterate that, please, Marisa? Yes, so the documentation should be at the activity level, not at the household level. So you will not be substantiating for each particular household how they have personally been impacted by coronavirus. You're going to be taking a look at it at, uh, at the higher level of how your overall emergency shelter, street outreach, prevention, rapid rehousing activity is factoring into your community's coronavirus response. So this actually brings, um, brings up an important point uh, that, you know, by virtue of the type of activities that are funded under ESG, it's almost harder to determine how an activity is not contributing to your coronavirus response. So if your initial reaction is, we're rehousing people, so um, we're, we're keeping people um, in non-congregate settings, we're keeping people off the street, so we're preventing spread of the virus, we're um, increasing, we're decreasing the risk of those households um, contracting coronavirus and that's contributing to coronavirus response. That initial um, instinct is correct and so, so we would actually encourage you all to, to take the extra step and document how your annual ESG is contributing to coronavirus and just um, making sure you close that loop so that you can have the added benefit of the flexibilities and the waivers for your annual ESG, and you're sort of using all available funds in the same way across the board. So you don't have, it's, it's easier um, after that initial effort to document everything um, to just sort of carry on your ESG program in the same way across the board. Thanks so much. I think that might cover most of the questions we wanted to address at this, at this break. So Marlisa, I know you were launching into a discussion of temporary emergency shelter. We'll turn it back over to the presentation. Okay, great, thank you. <laughs> 
Okay, so in uh, trying to better define and set up the parameters for temporary emergency shelter, we've included the criteria here. Um, the first three should look familiar because they are specifically addressed in the notice. So when you're, um, but I think that in distinguishing between temporary emergency shelter and emergency shelter, um, the habitability requirements are really important. So if you're, if you have a structure and it's, you're, you know that it's going to meet habitability, then you should just consider that an emergency shelter. Um, it meets habitability, you'll be able to meet the environmental review requirements. So for all intents and purposes, it's emergency shelter. When you're unable to meet um, e the ESG habitability requirements, then at that point, you're probably delving into temporary emergency shelter, uh, uh, you're, you're delving into temporary emergency shelter territory. So those, that type of structure, a portion of a structure, may be eligible as a temporary emergency shelter if it's used specifically for um, a public health emergency, in this case, COVID. Um, your local public health official has determined that temporary emergency shelter is necessary. So um, that is documentation that's required in order to be able to fund a temporary emergency shelter activity. And then this is intended for very limited use. It's only being used for the period of time needed for your community's coronavirus response, um, but no later than January 31st, 2022 unless HUD grants an exception, or, you know, unless HUD reevaluates the situation down the line and we recognize that, um, you know, the, the pandemic could last longer than that, but um, at this point in time, we are working with the January 31st, 2022 deadline. And then in trying to look, take a closer look at the attributes of temporary emergency shelter, in general terms, um, a temporary emergency shelter has to meet a person's very basic needs. And we're talking about, um, not even talking about habitability because the habitability requirements are waived. We're talking about um, protection from inclement weather. So you've got cover on all sides and overhead where you're not, you know, you're, you actually get protection. So there aren't gaps, um, you know, you're being protected from wind, cold, rain, et cetera, there's adequate space for um, program participants to sleep and rest. In particular, there are, there's enough room to uh, provide sleeping accommodations, so a mat, a cot, a bed for, um, for those structures that are providing overnight shelter. We do fund day shelters um, under the emergency shelter component in ESG. But if the structure is meant to be providing um, overnight shelter, then sleeping accommodations are necessary. And then access to sanitary facilities for hygiene and toileting. So if you are aware that the um, potential structure that you're looking at for a temporary emergency act activity doesn't meet those three very basic attributes, then you know that, um, that it's not going to be um, it's not going to meet um, HUD's definition of temporary emergency shelter. Next slide, please. So uh, eligible costs under the temporary emergency shelter activity are a little different than regular emergency shelter. Temporary emergency shelter also includes acquisition of real property up to the $2.5 million cap uh, services that are not only essential services under the emergency shelter component, but also include housing search and placement services, which are typically under the rapid rehousing and um, homelessness prevention component, as well as housing search and counseling services, which are eligible under the um, continuum of care program. And then to account for those services that you may be coming up with, um, those costs that you may come up with that we have not thought of, you can apply for additional shelter costs um, and HUD just needs to approve those in writing for those to be eligible. Um, and then, next slide please. 
this is just a quick overview of the uh, applicable requirements. Minimum period of use does not reply, apply. However, the, disability, the disposition instructions in Part 200 do apply, and we are going to go over that in a moment. Environmental review requirements do not apply. <clears throat> and then just a reminder here that local public health um, has to determine that temporary emergency shelter is necessary. Habitability does not apply, but lead-based paint still does apply, as well as the non-discrimination and accessibility requirements. Next slide, please. Okay, so in the, per in the case where you're using or you'd like to use um, ESG or ESG CV funds for acquisition or rehab of a temporary emergency shelter. Uh, the shelter itself has to be owned by a government or nonprofit. And the although minimum period of use requirements do not apply, they're waived for temporary emergency shelter. 2 CFR 200.311 still does apply. And those are the disposition requirements for real property. And they currently are limited to two options once the um, intended use um, is met. Repaying HUD, the acquisition and renovation costs for HUD, to HUD and retaining the title or selling the property and repaying HUD. So um, the, this, this is not the level of flexibility that we want to be able to provide. Um, we're working, the SNAPS office is working to be able to provide additional options, but you should know at this juncture that these are the, the current options. So come January 31st, 2022, um, at this point in time, you are looking at a repayment to HUD for any acquisition or renovation costs per the Part 200 requirements. So um, if you have additional questions about that, please let us know, and, um, and we will also um, update everyone if we're able to, um, to provide additional waivers or flexibilities for that. Next slide, please. Landlord incentives. So these can be used to pay landlords um, at the household level um, to be able to open up housing opportunities, to assist program participants to obtain housing for individuals and families at risk of or experiencing homelessness. So this is, um, this is attributed to the rapid rehousing and homelessness prevention component, and the, the total limit is three times the monthly rent of the unit, and it can include signing bonuses up to two times of the monthly rent, security deposits up to three times of the monthly rent, then also repairing damages that aren't covered by the security deposits, and paying the extra cost of cleaning or maintenance of units or of the unit or appliances. So. Um, it's collective, in other words, you can combine multiple eligible landlord incentive um, types up to that three monthly rent limit. Next slide, slide, please. So you're only budgeting these under rapid rehousing or homelessness prevention. The uh, landlord incentives are provided per household so not at the unit level, not at the activity level, but it's connected to a particular household. So think about trying to get um, a specific family, a specific program participant into a specific unit, and you can use incentives to try to open up that opportunity for that household. Um, this is not more of like a project-based rental assistance approach, so you're not trying to um, incentivize landlords to hold uh, units open, and that is still available, that approach, but it's just, it's just something different. It's project-based rental assistance under the ESG program. And it, these incentives can be used in conjunction with other funding, so you could use it, uh, use an ESG-funded landlord incentive to try to open up a, un a unit under a COC project or CDBG-CV, or coronavirus relief fund um, 
projects. As long as you're not duplicating any of the, um, the assistance and you're meeting all applicable ESG requirements. Next slide. So make sure that um, these costs are reasonable and necessary and um, that you're still meeting habitability standards. That's still a requirement for um, rapid rehousing and prevention activities. And you need to make sure that you're only providing incentives for units that are secured with an executive lease, an um, assigned lease. So that's where that connection to an actual household comes in. You're, you're um, successfully being able to place a, a particular household in a unit um, through that incentive. Next slide, please. So volunteer incentives, they can be used to provide, again, reasonable and necessary um, incentives to volunteers, and these volunteers are doing providing a direct um, service in under components, street outreach, emergency shelter, essential services, housing relocation and stabilization services during a coronavirus outbreak. The purpose is to um, increase your staffing capacity, make, making sure that providers have enough people to continue providing the services and um, connections to housing that are needed um, so that you can scale up or maintain your current um, level of operations. And this is um, specifically for those volunteers who are, you know, they're, they're providing a direct service. They're on the front lines. They have a higher risk of, um, of actually I'm mixing up that with hazard pay. So, um, forget I just said that part, but these are still volunteers that are necessary to, to carry out direct activities. And um, one, one way that you can think about it is that you can use these incentives to include and to outreach, incentivize people with lived experience as part of your projects, but, um, but it still needs to be tied to work preventing, preparing for and responding to coronavirus. So not necessarily planning activities or more um, like administrative oversight type of activities, but actual direct services. Next slide, please. Hotel motel costs, uh, these are already eligible activities under shelter operations. However, um, these costs may also include um, renting hotel or motel rooms directly, so not strictly housing um, hotel motel vouchers. Can also go to cleaning hotels or motel rooms used by program participants as well as repairs for damage above normal wear and tear of the room. Um, hotel or motel costs can be provided under the emergency shelter component, component and the um, universe of eligible program participants is expanded, not only those experiencing literal, literal homelessness, but also including those who are um, receiving rapid rehousing assistance, under the Continuum of Care program as well as ESG, uh, those who are receiving homelessness prevention assistance or um, those who are re residing in permanent supportive housing under the COC program. So um, it's not, it, this is um, directly related to being able to maintain social distancing and then also being able to provide non-congregate sheltering um, options where you need to um, uh, provide isolation or quarantine spaces for those who are at higher risk of um, contracting the virus. Next slide, please. So um, an important thing to remember is that um, all rental assistance requirements under rapid rehousing and homelessness prevention need to be met in the rare case that you are actually going to be using a hotel or motel space for rapid rehousing and homelessness prevention. So um, you, you, if you are actually going to be trying, if you're going to try to use um, like an extended stay, that's an example. Um, this is, a, again, a very limited case 
um, as uh, permanent housing, then you need to follow all re um, rental assistance requirements, including a lease, a rental assistant, uh, assistance agreement, habitability, rent reasonableness, everything to be able to use ESG or ESG CV for this purpose. So again, it's a very limited case. If you have questions about um, po possibly doing this, please submit an AAQ. But we expect that um, that nine times out of ten, you're not going to be able to use a hotel space for um, for rental assistance. And uh, there's no length of time or um, a stay limit for hotel or motel stays. But um, but as always. Um, the, the goal is to exit people into permanent housing as quickly as possible and also make sure that the costs are reasonable and appropriate and just taking into account the um, how stays in hotels and motels can be expensive. Okay, so another alternative requirement in the notice is the income limit for, under the at risk of homelessness definition. This has been raised from 30% to 50% when um, this is applicable for annual ESG that's used for COVID response as well as ESG CV. And um, when doing the income eligibility determination, it's really important to make sure that this is a prospective, a forward-looking um, evaluation, not retrospective, especially given um, just how, how dynamic the situation is now and how um, economically impacted people are due to coronavirus. So to really have an accurate um, idea of a person's income, it's essential that you look forward and the evaluation not be looking back to past um, examples of what income has been for a household. Um, just pointing you to the income calculator on the HUD exchange with the caveat that it has not at this point been updated with the increased income limit to 50%. Next slide, please. Um, this is a little bit off topic, although it's very relevant for coronavirus response. Um, the eviction moratoria and homelessness prevention eligibility is, um, is a very hot topic. Um, so I just want to mention a couple of considerations. Very low income households, they qualify for homelessness prevention by meeting one of the risk factors of the at risk of homelessness definition in addition to lacking resources and support networks and um, and meeting the income qualifications. So examples of some of those risk factors include facing eviction, uh, living up in doubled up or overcrowded situations. Um, so this these these are mentioned just to point out that there are many ways to qualify for homelessness prevention, not only um, in cases where a household is facing eviction that's initiated by a property owner or landlord. So if you, um, and it's also the case that uh, these other at-risk factors are much more likely to result in homelessness than um, than those facing eviction. So it's it's um, important to consider that the full population of households that are eligible for prevention. And then if you're still finding difficulty in carrying out your prevention activity during a moratorium, um, consider reprogramming funds to rapid rehousing because um, the there's also a crisis situation with people who are in non-congregate shelter situations who need to be moved into permanent housing. And so there is going to come a time when FEMA assistance for your non-congregate sheltering projects um, is, is exhausted. It is a time-limited resource. And so it's, it's so critical um, for both COVID response and for um, trying to prevent homelessness within communities to be able to house those people as soon as possible from non-congregate shelters. They're not returning to unsheltered situations. They're not returning to congregate shelter situ situations. Uh, next slide, please. Documentation um, 
is is um, I think a challenge as well for a lot of folks. So when someone, when a program participant is facing eviction or a leaseholder is facing eviction that's initiated by a property owner or landlord, they can qualify for homelessness prevention assistance under category one, risk factor C of the at risk of homelessness definition or category two of the definition of homeless. So when we're talking about at risk category one C, that's when the right to occupy housing is going to terminate in 21 days. The difference here between at-risk category 1C and homeless category 2 is that um, for, for category 2 of the homeless definition, the household is going to have to physically leave the residence within 14 days. So if you are um, trying to qualify someone under these situations, um, you don't need um, the equivalent of a court-ordered eviction action, per se. For at-risk, you need written notification from an entity with authority to terminate the tenancy. So it's the right to occupy housing under the at-risk definition that's going to be terminated within 21 days, not necessarily that someone's going to be physically removed from a unit. If um, if a landlord's notification provides like a remediation um, plan, so a way to avoid eviction, if you are going to qualify someone under this category, then your documentation has to also show that the, the applicant can't meet the terms of avoiding eviction. So again, this doesn't necessarily mean that um, in all cases, you won't be able to qualify someone under this um, under an, an eviction initiated by a property owner or landlord. There are other ways that uh, a program participant could be uh, facing eviction other than for non-payment of rent. And so just a reminder that eviction moratoria are dealing with non-payment of rent. So um, if someone's facing eviction, for another reason, other than non-payment of rent, th these categories are still, um, you can still qualify someone for prevention under these, these categories. Documentation for category two of the homeless definition, um, these need to be, th these can include the notice equivalent to an eviction action, a notice to quit, a notice to terminate, depending on what your state law is doesn't need to be an equivalent of a court-ordered eviction. But again, if there's no reasonable expectation that a household is going to lose their residence, uh, be physically removed within 14 days, then they're not qualifying for category two. Next slide, please. So the, um, the applicable ESG CV activities, switching, switching gears here, um, we went over this in the beginning, but um, just as a quick recap, the, um, the ESG CV activities that are included in a substantial amendment or annual action plan that for which HUD completed its review on or after September 1st, um, that's the effective date of the ESG CV notice. Those include the medium term rental assistance limited to three to 12 months, um, not three to 24 months, which it, which it usually is. And um, the point that we wanted to highlight here is that arrears do not count towards the 12 month limitation. So um, arrears do count towards the 24 month limitation per program participant. Um, but an example here um, that may help uh, help this sink in, the way I think about it is that um, if you're doing, let's say, six months of arrears, the total, the max amount of arrears that you can provide, that would go to, um, you would be able to provide that in addition to 12 months of rental assistance. Um, so you feasibly, someone, a household could receive 18 months of assistance, um, the six, month of rent, six months of rental arrears plus the 12 months um, maximum under medium-term rental assistance for ESG CV funds. And then the emergency shelter limit, again, is January 31st, 2022. 
the grace period for coordinated entry, written standards, and HMIS. Um, we included a graphic here to show that um, it's applicable for costs that are incurred between January 21st, 2020 and June 30th, 2020. And if, um, if costs are incurred between that time frame, there's 60 days, up to 60 days from the start of that project's operation um, to come into compliance with the coordinated entry written standards and HMIS requirements. Next slide, please. So going to the, um, this one example where you're actually not able to use the full 60-day grace period, uh, let's say you had a temporary emergency shelter activity that started June 1st. Uh, you would have up until that June 30th, 2020 time period, so you would have a 30-day grace period um, to come into compliance with those requirements. Next slide, please. And then very quickly, um, for those of you who have not completed your substantial amendment or annual action plan submission, the certification requirements are that um, <clears throat> they must be submitted for um, substantial amendments um, for round two funding. So if you've already sent, if you've already submitted your round one certs and SF424 and SF424D, you need to follow up with another um, round of certs for round two funding. And if round two and round one were submitted at the same time, then in that case, you, you only need to submit one, um, one package of certs and SF424, SF424D. But um, just make sure that you are reflecting the total amount for round one and round two award amounts in your 424. Next slide, please. So for non-state ESG CV um, ESG recipients, the um, the appendix, the appendices uh, that include certifications for ESG CV or um, for annual ESG CV for non for COVID response as well as ESG CV, the ones that are applicable for you include Appendix One, which are the ESG CV certs, and Appendix Three, which are the annual ESG um, certs for um, activities that are for COVID response. So if you've already submitted the interim certifications, then you do not need to resubmit anything. And um, if you are electing to reprogram any of your annual ESG funds for COVID response, you may submit um, Appendix 3 certs, but you're not required to for each annual grant. Um, even though your old certs uh, certify that you're going to meet matching requirements and you're going to meet minimum period of use requirements, um, the notice provides cover and says that those certifications are not applicable, that you're not required to meet match or um, follow the minimum period of use requirements if those funds are used for uh, coronavirus response. So no action required. And then finally, um, before we get to uh, Q&A, just want to flag for you all that the waiver, um, the ESG CV notice provides uh, you with the flexibility to um, request additional waivers. Uh, if you do decide to uh, request a waiver for statutory or regulatory requirements, please submit those to your field office, include a description of the project, uh, cite the statute or the regs uh, that you're requesting to have waived, explain the reasons for good cause, um, and then also identify why the waiver is necessary to prevent, prepare for, and respond to COVID or how it's necessary to, to um, PPR, as we say. And then um, you can also include a request to extend the January 31st, 2022 time limit for temporary emergency shelter and emergency shelter. You can also request to expend funds on other temporary emergency shelter costs that were not already identified in the ESG CV notice. And with that, uh, thanks for bearing with us and listening to only my voice for long periods of time, but um, I'm going to turn it over to Mandy so that we can get to some of your questions.
Marlisa, thank you so much. And thanks everyone for, for all of the great questions. They're coming in fast and furious, and we're trying to answer as many as we can in the chat. Um, also know that we'll, we'll get as many answers out to you as we can if, if you don't get a response to your particular question today. Um, so we have a couple of key categories of questions, but one of the questions has, uh, some of the questions have had to do with the new mega waiver that came out. It's mega waiver number three that came out on September 30th. Um, and there, um, so I think there's one waiver related to ESG in that, um, that memo. Um, and folks are asking if there needs to be a new notification provided to HUD. Um, and so Marlisa, I know the answer to this one and, and the answer to that is yes, please do send notification to your HUD field office if you wanna take advantage of uh, the ESG waiver that's contained in that memo. Um, and then some people are asking about the fair market rent requirement being eliminated and waived um, and kind of where the authority for that is coming from. Um, and so I can take this one as well. So it's just a reminder that the FMR requirement was waived in the very first mega waiver that came out, um, allowing recipients to use a rent reasonableness standard as well. Um, and some folks have asked why that waiver was not extended in the, the new mega waiver that came out on September 30th. And the reason for that is because it's included in the notice. So it didn't need to be waived per um, a separate waiver authority. So um, Marlisa did talk about this, but the ability to use a rent reasonableness standard in lieu of the fair market rent requirements during this time. Okay, so some of the other key categories of questions we're getting, and we're gonna try to group these. Um, I guess the first one is related to temporary emergency shelter. Um, and so Marlisa, do you just wanna start off by giving some high notes on what, what needs to happen after um, temporary emergency shelters need to come offline? Yes. So um, in all cases, if funds are used, if, um, if funds are used for acquisition or rehab, then HUD, we will still need to issue disposition instructions. So you would be working one-on-one -on -one with HUD um, for specific instructions. We may do this on a case-by-case um, -case basis, or we may issue an additional notice um, that provides general instructions for all recipients. But um, right now, a sort of worst-case scenario, if SNAPS is not able to provide additional uh, flexibility, we will um, we will do a calculation for one of the two scenarios that's uh, allowed under 2 CFR 200.311, um, namely to repay HUD the um, acquisition and renovation costs for retain and in the case where you're retaining the title of the property, or um, we would do a calculation to figure out how much you need to repay HUD for when you're, you're selling the property. So the disposition instructions would include that calculation. We would arrive at a final cost um, for what HUD is expected to um, be repaid. And then at that point, after the repayment, then um, the recipient is you know free and clear, so to speak, and then you could use that property for whatever purpose you'd like. Um, Ideally, what we'd like to do is to be able to avoid um, any repayment situation and then um, provide you guidance on what would need to happen to be able to convert that to emergency shelter, permanent housing. But at this point, um, as I mentioned, we're looking at a repayment before um, any conversion to a different use um, is, uh, is possible. Thank you. We have a couple of questions about what qualifies as temporary emergency shelter. And so in the, in the slides, um, back on slide 26, you talk about protect, you know, providing protection from inclement weather uh, with cover on all sides and overhead. Um, and so I have a couple of questions for you. Um, would a covered parking garage with open sides qualify? No, because we are looking at um, 
cover on all sides. So if you have any sort of open in, open sides, like an um, like an open air overhang, or you know something like an an open um, garage, that would not that would not qualify. Okay. Um, and what about tent structures? So if we're talking about like um, a sprung structure, like a military style tent where um, you know, it's it's substantial. There's uh, in many cases there's there could be um, you know there's ventilation, heat, um, air conditioning, even um, those type of substantial tents would qualify as temporary emergency shelter. If we're talking about camping tents, like um, I think one example that we've come across is just like an open field with individual um, camping tents set up. Uh, that would not qualify as a temporary emergency shelter, but the camping tents could be um, eligible as a street outreach cost to just provide um, meet an, an immediate urgent physical need um, for cover, but it would not be a temporary emergency shelter. Okay. Um, this is a question about hotel and motel stays, and is this we know it's eligible, um, and can you just speak, is this going to qualify as temporary emergency shelter, or is it going to qualify under some other type of eligible activity? So there are some cases where a hotel motel stay um, is just going to be a normal emergency shelter operations cost. So it's, it's typically funded under emergency shelter operations. And if you have, um, if you're just issuing vouchers um, and you're, you know, you've, let's say you've met, you meet, you've met shelter capacity and then you're just sending folks over to, um, to a local hotel motel, that would not be considered temporary emergency shelter but something more along the lines of um, a non-congregate shelter situation where a provider is renting or taking over an entire hotel or motel, like renting out the entire property. Um, that's a situation where a hotel is not open to the public at large and it's, um, it's not really functioning as a hotel or a motel anymore. It's, it's really, for all intents and purposes, uh, no different than like a school that's being taken over or another public space. Um, and so in those situations where the whole entire hotel or motel is used for um, non-congregate sheltering projects, that is a situation that would um, fall under temporary emergency shelter. Okay. And I think the last question on temporary emergency shelters, uh, you were talking about the documentation, the support that is necessary. Can you speak a little bit to what you might expect to see? Um, I'm looking for the specific question that someone was asking, what, what might be reasonable support for the need for temporary emergency shelter? Yes, yeah, so, we're not talking here about um, public health officials going and physically inspecting each individual structure. Um, it's, it's at a higher activity level. So um, the public health official, we're expecting that um, recipients would work with public health, provide them with um, an overall descri description of, of the, um, the project. So identifying that you know, because, you know, uh, social distancing or physical distancing is required in our shelter facilities, this is an example, um, we need to um, erect a sprung structure to provide additional overflow space. Um, and so that is why we need this temporary emergency shelter activity. And then describing just that sprung structure, like the sprung structure will provide, um, we will be housing, we'll be sheltering people, providing mats or cots, um, you know, the access to sanitary facilities, um, we'll be, you know, providing boxed, boxed foods, um, boxed meals or individually prepared meals, like 
just giving an overview of what the project will entail so that the um, public health official is, is basically signing off on that and saying, yes, you know, this is, this is a necessary measure for coronavirus response in our community. Thank you. We're going to shift gears and um, talk about landlord incentives for a few minutes, and I know we, we don't have a whole lot of time left. So, Marlisa, are landlord incentives eligible as um, a standalone cost, so to speak? So, say you have another form of assistance providing, you know, make, uh, paying for the rental payments. Could ESG just fund landlord incentives? Yes, yes, you can provide landlord incentives uh, in conjunction with continuum of care program projects. So let's say you're trying to use um, COC-funded rapid rehousing and you're trying to provide an incentive to get a particular household into a COC-funded unit, uh, you can use ESG landlord incentives for that purpose. So in that way, it would be a standalone ESG activity, but um, it always needs to be um, associated with or used to get a particular household into a unit. Okay. And if a landlord has multiple units, can they receive multiple incentives? They can, yes. It's at a, the individual um, household level. So just think of the incentives linked to a particular household. Okay. And last one on landlord incentives. Do you have any advice on documenting or documentation relative to signing bonuses and what that should look like? Um, so there's a lot of leeway with signing bonuses. Um, there have been some ideas, some good ideas about trying to like add some contingency or um, I guess linking it to specific um, activities. So I think some recipients have come up with or some providers have come up with the idea of offering a landlord bonus to like improve a unit or, you know, do repairs, something like that. While we couldn't make the cost of repairs a, like an, an, a direct landlord incentive cost, you could do something like we're providing this signing bonus um, so that a landlord can, you know, make some necessary repairs or something like that. Um, but um, just substantiating that it's reasonable and necessary that you're meeting the that you're not exceeding the three months um, rent cap. So that's important to show the, the total cost that you're using it for. And then also showing that um, as a result of the incentive that's being provided that um, a particular household was able to get into the unit with a signed lease. So those are the key documentation points that, that are good to include. Thanks. Okay, well, we have many more questions than we'll ever be able to get to today, but uh, there have been a couple of questions on rent arrears um, and the eligibility of paying for rent arrears and if rent arrears can be paid, um, under what circumstances they can be paid. Um, so if those um, arrears need to be paid to um, the um, the current house, uh, if they can be paid on, on behalf of someone who's currently housed, for example, maybe to keep them in their unit, or if they could only be paid in order to get someone into um, a new unit, or any, any discussion around eligibility of rent arrears and some best practices around paying for rent arrears. Sure, and so the, the eligibility requirements for rental arrears are the same for um, homelessness prevention and rapid rehousing in general. So um, depending on the, the particular situation being faced by the household, um, I think in most cases, this is usually related to a situation where someone's facing an eviction action um, initiated by a landlord or a property owner. So um, they would absolutely still need to meet the prevention or rapid rehousing or the prevention requirements. So they need to be um, 
at imminent risk of homelessness, so meeting category two of the homeless definition where they're about to uh, lose their property within 14 days, or um, they need to be meeting um, at risk category 1C where their uh, right to tenancy is gonna be lost within 21 days. So those are the two situations where someone could be um, paying for rental arrears and it, it's the same situation where they're not able to pay that um, if someone is falling under um, the criteria for a more, if they're covered by the eviction moratorium um, for not paying rent. So that el those eligibility requirements still stand. Well, thank you so much. So we are at time, I believe. Um, do we want to take more questions or Marley said you have some closing comments for us? I think we do need to um, leave it at that for this webinar, but um, please keep the questions coming, whether it's through the AAQ. Thanks so much to um, Mandy and the rest of the team for working on the chat questions. Thanks so much for bearing with us through this uh, really dense material. Um, continue to check in with us during office hours every Friday, uh, where we're gonna continue to answer a lot of these questions or submit any unanswered questions on the AAQ. Thank you so much for, um, for all of your hard work in ramping up your programs during this really hard time. Know that we're with you and are gonna continue to provide as much support as we can. So with that, we're going to end the webinar and, um, and everyone have a great day. Thank you.